Of All Things by Robert C. Benchley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 The Most Popular Book of the Month. New York City, including all boroughs, telephone directory. New York Telephone Company, New York, 1920. Eight volumes, 1208 pages. In picking up this new edition of a popular favorite, the reviewer finds himself confronted by a nice problem in literary ethics. The reader must guess what it is. There may be said to be two classes of people in the world, those who constantly divide the people in the world into two classes, and those who do not. Both classes are extremely unpleasant to meet socially, leaving practically no one in the world whom one cares very much to know. This feeling is made poignant to the point of becoming an obsession by a careful reading of the present volume. We are herein presented to some 500,000 characters, each one deftly drawn in a line or two of agate type, each one standing out from the rest in bold relief. It is hard to tell which one is the most lovable. In one mood, we should say W.S. Custard of Minnie Ford Avenue. In another, more susceptible frame of mind, we should stand by the character who opens the book and who first introduces us into this kingdom of make-believe. Mr. V. Agard, the old impt and expt. How one seems to see him impting and expting all the hot summer day through year and year out, always heading the list, but always modest and unassuming, always with a kindly word and a smile for passers-by on Broadway. It is perhaps inaccurate to say that V. Agard introduces us to the book. He is the first flesh-and-blood human being with whom the reader comes in contact, but the initial place in the line should technically go to the A.A. and A.A. Excelsior Company, having given credit where credit is due. However, let us express our personal opinion that this name is a mere trick designed to crowd out all other competitors in the field for the honor of being in the premier position. For it must be obvious to anyone with any perception at all that the name doesn't make sense. No firm could be named the A.A. and A.A. Company, and the author of the telephone directory might better have saved his jokes until the body of the book. After all, Gellett Burgess does that sort of thing much better than anyone else could hope to. But, beginning with V. Agard, and continuing through to Mrs. L. Zyphers of Yetman Avenue, the reader is constantly aware of the fact that here are real people living in a real city, and that they represent a problem which must be faced. Sharp as we find the character etching in this book, the action, written and implied, is even more remarkable. Let us, for instance, take Mr. Semmel Dreislinger, whose business is fern repering, or Peter Shalagian, who does pumplet binding. Into whose experience do these descriptions not fit? The author need only mention a man binging pumplets to bring back a flood of memories to each and every one of us, perhaps our old hometown in New England, where binding pumplets was almost a right during the long winter months, as well as a social function of no mean proportions. It is the ability to suggest, to insinuate, these automatic memories on the part of the reader, without the use of extra words, that make the author of this work so worthy of the name of craftsman in the literary annals of the day. Perhaps most deft of all is the little picture that is made of Louise Winkler, who is the village sculp-specialist. 
One does not have to know much medieval history to remember the position that the skulk specialist used to hold in the community during the Wars of the Roses, or during Shay's Rebellion, for that matter. In those days, to be a skulk specialist was as important a post as that of Club Bling Stipples, now done for New York City by Mr. Graham. People came from miles around to consult with the local sculp specialist on matters pertaining not only to sculps, but to knut goods and whirlwools, both of which departments of our daily life have now been delegated to separate agencies. Then gradually, with the growth of the trade guild movement, there came the era of specialization in industry, and the high offices of the sculp specialist were dissipated among other trades, until only that coming strictly under the head of sculp specialing remained. To this estate has Miss Winkler come, and in that part of the book which deals with her and her work, we have, as it were, a little epic on the mutability of human endeavor. It is all too short, however, and we are soon thereafter plunged into the dreary round of exting and imping, this time through a character called J. Wubby, who is interesting only in so far as he is associated with M. Rubble and A. N. Wubbenhorst, all of whom come together at the bottom of the column. The plot, in spite of whatever virtues may accrue to it from the acid delineation of the characters and the vivid action pictures, is the weakest part of the work. It lacks coherence. It lacks stability. Perhaps this is because of the nature of the book itself. Perhaps it is because the author knew too well his Dunsany, or his Wells, or his Bradstreet. But it is the opinion of the present reviewer that the weakness of the plot is due to the great number of characters which clutter up the pages. The Russian school is responsible for this. We see here the logical result of a sedulous aping of those writers such as Tolstoy, Andreev, Turgenev, Dostoevsky, or even Pushkin, whose meteor it was to fill the pages of their books with an inordinate number of characters many of whom the reader was to encounter but once, let us say on the Nevsky Prospect, or in the Smolny Institute, but all of whom added their peculiar names. We believe that we will not offend when we refer to Russian names as peculiar, to the general confusion of the whole. In practice, the book is not flawless. There are 500,000 names, each with a corresponding telephone number. But through some error in editing, the numbers are all wrong. Proof of this may be had by the simple expedient of calling up any one of the subscribers using the number assigned by the author to that name. Any name will do. Let us say Nicholas Wimpy Haxlam, 2131. If the call is put in bright and early in the morning, the report will come over the wire just as the lights are going on for evening of the same day that Harlem 2131 does not answer. The other numbers are invariably equally unproductive of results. The conclusion is obvious. Aside from this point, the book is a success. End of chapter 20 Recording by Arnold Banner, Thurmond, North Carolina